All right. So thank y'all so much for coming back here. We're episode number 296 of the Minding Your Business podcast, entrepreneurship, real estate, trending news. There's no business like minding your own. I'm your host, uh, Ron Brooks, aka Champ Ron. Of course, I'm here in Memphis. And once again, we're here for another episode of the podcast, getting closer to that magic number of 300, uh, which I'm excited. You guys have been rocking with me for a long time. And so I'm extremely appreciative, uh, to say the least. Subscribe to the podcast, five star, five star, wherever you get your pods. That helps us to continue to grow the MYB audience. And of course, you can check me out as always at champ10k.com. Recording this on uh, July the 15th. Uh, man, we're just mowing down through this year. Um, it's just crazy. There's And there's so much going on. So that's why I appreciate you guys rocking with me. There's a lot of things that you could be doing. Um, you could be somewhere paying $10 a gallon for gas, or you could be... Uh, you know, looking for baby formula or, or do whatever you could be doing. Um, but uh, you're here rocking with us and we're going to introduce our guests here uh, shortly. But uh, again, Champ 10K, that's where you can connect with me. I've got a ton of resources to help you and your business. Uh, things that I come across that I share, uh, all my tools and things of that nature. You can go right there. They're all uh, sectioned there all for you. So if you see value, uh, in any of that, uh, if you're launching your real estate business, you're looking for a skip tracing, you're looking for uh, to hire a virtual assistant, um, you, you need uh, attorney approved documentation that you can uh, review with your attorney uh, and be able to, to move forward with uh, with doing business. Whatever that is, I likely have a resource for you there. So it's all in one place, champ10k.com. Uh, for those of you that have an interest in kind of more one-on-one -on -one coaching and mentoring, uh, I have recently started up a new Facebook group uh, called The Presidential Suite with Ron Brooks. Um, oftentimes, I'm asked not just about, you know, say real estate or about nonprofit leadership, uh, but I'm asked about, you know, where to find funding for my business, grants, uh, low-cost loans, things of that nature. Um, those of you that are interested in launching your own podcast platform for podcast marketing, whatever that is, I, I needed kind of one space where I could have all of that. And I found that one space, uh, which is the presidential suite. Uh, so look at that uh, on Facebook. The first 25 people are going to join the group for free uh, at no charge to you. And so... Uh, definitely jump on that. Uh, link is in the bio. And I uh, would love nothing other than to have you be a part of that. There's going to be all kinds of resources shared. I'll be doing uh, live uh, sessions. I'll be doing one-on-ones. I'll be sharing uh, information uh, there with you uh, that you'll be able to take advantage of and, and leverage uh, for your own uh, benefit and edification. So with that being said, I want to introduce today's guest, uh, Adam Piori, that's joining us uh, here today uh, from the Northeast area. He's got uh, a, a really dope book that I want you to check out. The link's in the bio, uh, The New Kings of New York. We're going to talk a little bit of real estate. We're going to talk about uh, how rents uh, have evolved um, in uh, the city of New York, uh, obviously one of the biggest cities and one of the more influential cities in our country. Uh, to say the least, uh, we want to talk about uh, that rental market and 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 kind of you know Adam's thoughts on it and you know ultimately uh, why you should go and get the book. I'm going to order my copy uh, as well uh, because I, these are the type of reads that I like to have. And so that's what this is what we bring to the NYB community, uh, the the high level um, you know, guests uh, such as Adam. Uh, that are going to speak and pour into us today, man. So, Adam, thank you so much for taking time, buddy, on a Friday. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely, man. I'd love to have you, man, and, and really appreciate it. So, man, let's jump in. Before we get into the book, um, let's talk a little bit about yourself. Kind of, you know, kind of tell us a little bit about you and, and kind of how you got to where you are today. Uh, sure, yeah. I've been, a you know, I've been a journalist forever, you know, my whole career. Um Started at local newspapers. I think my, my first job was uh, covering uh, t small towns in New Jersey. And then I covered Congress. And then I lived abroad in Cambodia. Then I worked for Newsweek, the Boston Globe. And um, I've just been a freelance journalist for a while. I like to tell, tell stories. I like to write long form stories. Um, and uh, yeah. And, and so one of my clients was a, a real estate magazine. I did profiles for them sometimes called The Real Deal, which has covered New York City real estate. And um, and so they they wanted uh, to do a book 
they wanted to get into book publishing and I had done a pretty successful, my first book, which had nothing to do with real estate, uh, was actually about um, bioengineering, like hacking the human body and mind, but it was a mainstream kind of science book. Um, yeah. And they wanted me to do a book on the first 20 years of, of the new millennium. And uh, yeah, and I've been, uh, so I've written about a lot of things, you know, I've covered war, I've covered Congress. Um, but now I just, at this point in my career, when I'm, you know, sort of on my own, I like to just spin out long narrative stories that you can get lost in. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and I love the, those kind of books like Barbarians at the Gate or Liar's Poker, or, you know, all these books, you know, where you can get into a world and be in the room with people. Um, and, and for real estate in New York City, the stakes are really easy to understand since there's, you know, sometimes billions of dollars at stake. And I wanted to understand also how the city had changed, you know, um, when I used to come to it, when I was a little kid in the 70s and 80s, um, it was, uh, you know, it, w it was the Bronx were burning, as they say. And, uh, and it was, um, you know, there was a lot of crime, I guess, and it had this reputation as, I mean, I, I thought it was great the whole time, but, um, but it was, you know, people were scared in New York City, I guess. I don't know. And then all of a sudden, you know, yeah. here we are in the in the 2000s and people are selling penthouses for two hundred and fifty million dollars, you know, uh, and people are coming from around the world to stash their money there. So I just kind of wanted to understand what had happened. I got priced out of the city myself when I had a kid, uh, you know, yeah. um, so I just wanted to understand sort of how that happens, what the policies were that happened, but also, you know, since the real deal, they wanted me to follow some of the people at the center of this. So um, one of the guys I followed was Steve Ross, who he owns the Miami Dolphins um, and did a yeah. Time Warner Center in Hudson Yards. And then I followed somebody who went bankrupt, uh, a couple other people at the center of the action, you know, tried to build these characters and tell the story through their eyes. Yeah, absolutely. No, that that's really good. I mean, that's a really interesting one. Kind of your your upbringing in in journalism as you've covered, um, man. That that's super dope. And you know, I guess let's get into a little bit of kind of the the New York discussion, right? So, you know, what you know, if you go back to the very beginning, you know, you know, what kind of what impacts you know rents there? Because you know, you think about it, and you know, I, I've traveled to to New York several times for business. You know, obviously, I'm very aware of the you know, the, the price point, particularly for someone that's coming from the South, right? Yeah. Um, so it's interesting how, um, you know, we never really know a lot of the the factors that go into um, the policies and, and, and things of that nature, Adam, that contribute to um, how we ultimately get to where, you know, you have a, a very high price market. Like you say, you're getting priced out as you expand your family. Um, yeah. Yeah. What, what is it? I guess. Yeah. What what did kind of happen? What's what's kind of the, the rundown there? Well, so what happened is, uh, you know, in the in the 70s in particular, uh, manufacturing moved, you know, kind of fell fell off a cliff. And, and New York City used to be more of like a blue collar city, you know, um, so a lot of jobs left and a lot of people left and, uh, you know, a million. Uh, I think a couple million people left, but there was a lot of immigrants that came in. But even so, the immigrants saved the city. But even so, in the 1970s, I think New York City lost basically like a net population of like 800,000 or something crazy like that. Like, you know, oh, wow. they, they yeah. lost the population of another small city. So um, so that caused a lot of things to happen. Um, you know, the some and it started to go it was on the verge of bankruptcy and they they called it kind of a vicious cycle like people left tax revenue went down so they had to cut services so you know garbage piled up there was less law enforcement um i think like drug addicts rallied outside the city because sir you know rehab services were cut i don't know all sorts of crazy stuff happened and it just was this vicious cycle that kind of spiraled downward driving more people out and so um, really since the 70s, it's been a gradual rebound of people coming back and rebuilding that population. 
So first you had Ed Koch in the, in the eighties and he was, you know, trying to basically rebuild the parts that had been totally abandoned. Like just even just getting people to live in areas of the Bronx that were empty and other places. Right. And, and then you had, um, you know, and, and that, that worked for a while. And then Giuliani came in and he, um, you know, he was really cracked down on crime and in, in sort of a fascist way, but he also um, tried to, um, you know, his planning policies kind of like activated the spaces. Um, yeah. And I, and I sort of, uh, I, I, I kind of um, started with him because it was towards the end of the, the millennium that, uh, that uh, the sort of the final phase of this gentrification happened. And really what happened is just a lot of people moved in and they had another cycle. And, uh, and so that's one of the things that's been driving up rents is, finally the city started to fill up. And you know, th there was this uh, theory back at around the turn of the millennium about creative cities. You know, you, you get yeah. a, a city where, um, yeah, I mean, like Memphis is a creative city, right? You get a city where it's, it's like cheap, so interesting people move in, you know, artists and edgy people and just, there's a bit of anarchy and stuff and, and creativity thrives and then everybody wants to be there. So then you get other creative people and the theory was when when Bloomberg took over was uh, that uh, if you attracted creative people, then then you would get like rich creative people and then like, you know, tech people because right. uh, they would want to be around the interesting edgy people where where ideas are thriving. So you, you build like, you know, more parks, you put more money into amenities, you make it safer and people will come. And then it'll have the opposite of the vicious cycle. They'll have what they call the virtuous cycle. So that's what yeah. Bloomberg tried to do. And, um, and it kind of works beyond anyone's dreams. Everybody wanted to go to New York and then people got priced out. I mean, that's basically what happened, but then, yeah. but then what happened is there was just, you know, and I kind of chronicle this in my book, like people started to build for the 1%. I mean, there was all this, the inequalities that have occurred in part because of globalization you know what I mean? Like all those manufacturing jobs went to third world countries, you know, smaller group of people in the U S making the money. And so there's greater inequality and that was reflected in the housing. And, uh, and so some of these people that I, uh, talked to, um, you know, they kind of rode that wave. I mean, Steve Ross, who owns the Miami dolphins, like I said, is, um, he's an interesting example because he came to the city in 1968 from mm -hmm. Detroit. He, he moved there the day after Bobby Kennedy was shot. He decided wow. life was too short and and uh, quit his job as a real estate tax attorney and moved to the city, and uh, and he he was like this brash sort of overconfident guy. He got fired from a couple jobs. He told his and I told tell the story in the book. He told his boss to fuck off basically, um, <laughs> and uh, like his boss said, <laughs> do it. He pitched a he was working for Bear Stearns and his boss they pitched an idea he had for real estate in the like investors meeting and somebody was like, why don't we let Steve handle that? And his boss said, well, I don't have any confidence in Steve because they've been arguing. And so he, oh. he said, well, fuck you. I don't have any confidence in you. So he got fired. <laughs> and then, so he borrowed 10,000 bucks from his mom right. <laughs> and his previous, and he right. didn't think he'd get another job. So his previous job had been working as an attorney, like basically uh, raising money from rich people uh, to put it in these, what they call syndicates to invest in, in government, uh, funded projects. So he yeah. started doing that in New York and he started, um, in, he started, uh, kind of approaching well-connected people who were in charge of, um, finding who would, uh, you know, who would build these government projects, affordable housing. And he started giving them a piece of, uh, the project and then they would, you know, help him get the project. It uh, doesn't, uh, you know, and then um, he started and then he would hire young, ambitious people to help him build it. And so he started doing affordable housing. So he was like insulated when the bottom fell out of the New York City real estate market and he was learning. And then he, yeah. he just kind of kept building whatever, you know, as the city gentrified until he was building for the top 1%, um, you know, and, and which is where the kind of the, where the book kind of ends up, he builds this, it's the largest private development. It's called Hudson Yards. And, mm -hmm. uh, and like they, what they did is they, they, um, built, he had to pay a billion dollars to build a, uh, 
platform over the, these train yards. So the only yeah. way to make that money back and beat the other bidders was to build ultra luxury housing for the 1%. And so by the time Hudson Yards debuted, there was this huge backlash. I mean, I don't know if you guys remember, but Amazon was looking for a headquarters yes. and they chose New York. And that was like the dream come true for like Bloomberg. You know, that's that's the, the payoff for all the creative thing. And then all the neighborhood people were like, well, you know, we don't want these rich people to price us out. Like, screw that, you know? And then right. so there's this backlash and that's when Hudson Yards came out. And that's kind of, I mean, initially at the turn of the millennium, everybody was like, oh, great. You're building parks. You know, you're turning the city. You're doing all this great stuff. Everybody loved it until they looked around and the, all the artists had been replaced by tech bros and they couldn't afford to live there. Or um, so there was this backlash and a bunch of like, you know, uh, AOC, and a bunch of the socialists actually got voted in in the uh, in in the state capital, and they started passing all this legislation that kind of put a stop to some of the these things. And um, yeah, it wasn't that good for some developers? Yeah. So that, that's part of it. I mean, that's in a nutshell. I mean, there's a lot of other things like like Russian oligarchs, you know. And I mean, I <laughs> yeah. can I can tell you. I'll just tell you one one more story since I'm just. But yeah. There, there was, you know, the, these uh, developers who I also follow called the Zeckendorfs, and they got this. They owned, um, they were part of this real estate family, and they they owned this high end real estate firm, uh, a brokerage firm, Brown Harris Stevens. So they would always stop their brokers in the hallway and be like, "What do you need? What are you seeing in the market?" And the people said, "Well, you know, a lot of rich people are moving back to the city, and they want these eight room co ops so they can have their families on the." Upper East Side, but there aren't any more. Like you could get them for really cheap in the '90s, but now you can't get them. So yeah. then they they hit on this idea to build condos for the one percent, and and everybody thought they were crazy, and they they spent more for land to win the bidding than anybody else. And then they they built these condos that had like wine cellars and this and views and this level of luxury that people weren't necessarily accustomed to, and it sold out. And um, so they kept doing this. They had Goldman Sachs White Hole Fund um, back then. And they, they built this building called 15 Central Park West, which was, I think, like Sting lived there and maybe A-Rod and, and um, you know, Jeff Gordon from NASCAR and, and uh, yeah. all these king of the world apartments, you know, uh, across the street from the park. And, and it was so successful. But when they wait, they bid for it, they bid much more than anyone else. And everybody else thought they were crazy, but they had their own calculations of how much they were going to sell the apartments for. And it paid off. It was so successful. People in the industry nicknamed the building Limestone Jesus. But anyways, the guy who had the, the penthouse was this guy, you know, Sandy Wild, the former chairman of Citigroup. And yeah. he just plucked a number out of thin air. Basically, he doubled the number of when when they bought the the land at the time the zeckendorfs in order to make the money back that they had invested in the land they would have had to sell the apartments for two thousand dollars a square foot which everybody thought was absurd like oh you they, the thousand dollar square foot number had only just been surpassed even donald trump said it was it was like way too much but they did yeah. that and then they they sold they managed to sell it for that amount I think they even managed to sell for like maybe four or 5,000 a square foot. So Sandy oh, wow. Wild plucks a number out of thin air and he puts his penthouse on the market and he doubles the price. He, he puts the price at $89 million for his penthouse, which comes out to about $13,000 a square foot. And this Russian oligarch who's a fertilizer king just snaps up the property. He also bought Trump's uh, estate in Florida for much more than, you know, the market showed it was worth, but he was going through a divorce with his wife and wanted to shield his assets from her, at least according to her. And so he yeah. bought this building for $13,000 a square foot in an area where people thought you couldn't even, you know, sell real estate for 2000 a square foot. And, you know, his college age daughter moved in and it made all these headlines, but that reset the yeah. market all around the park. And suddenly anytime, uh, any property came up along the park, it would go up for auction. And every, you know, the people who were willing to pay the most were the ones who were willing to bid the most aggressively. Suddenly everybody is looking at, oh, you can get $13,000 a square foot. So I'll just bid, you know, I'll bid 4,000 a square foot or whatever. So all, all right. these properties around the park became, they started building for the 1%. And, um, you know, the, the, the high end real estate market is, I think it's maybe, I don't know, maybe 10% 
or something. Yeah. I forget the numbers there in my book, but maybe 10% of the total inventory. But uh, I think it was like more than 50% of the construction that occurred, um, you know, at a certain point um, in the, in the, the mid aughts um, was for this Uber 1%, you know, th these, and, and it attracted a lot of Russian oligarchs and people looking to shield their money. Uh, cause you could, you could found, you could form a shell corporation and, and, um, shield your identity. And, uh, and so it became sort of the, the world's most expensive safety deposit boxes. So that didn't help rents in New York city very much for the working man either. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and there were the, they, some of these were ghost towers, you know, like people wouldn't even live in them. They just, it was just a safe place to protect their money. And now the Biden administration, you know, since Russia has invaded Ukraine is trying to go after some of these, but a lot of them are shielded behind multiple shell companies. But, you right. know, like, I mean, there was like a former oil minister in Nigeria who was like, you know, accused of bribery. He had one of these apartment, you know, every once in a while, these things, you know, the, 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 the prime minister of, of Malaysia, his, you know, he was, uh, forced out and accused of, um, embezzling money from the sovereign wealth fund. And, you know, his son had an apartment, <laughs> you know, like it was, uh, it became this magnet. I mean, that's a problem down South and like in Miami, but it, a, a number of other places too, but this, this yeah. whole evolution is what my book's about. But it's through it's through these high stakes deals and the people who are also, you know, kneecapping each other and having, you know, these fascinating human dramas because the stakes are very easy to understand when you're trying to make a billion dollars. So it's, it's fun to write about as a writer. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that, man. Very rich, um, you know, kind of in-depth uh, information you were, you were providing there. Um, you know, Adam, what's kind of the thought in terms of like, the, um, you know, obviously for those of us that are, aren't New Yorkers, right? You think about the, you know, the different bureaus, right? You got Harlem, Yonkers, you know, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Long Island, you know, you go all the way around. You know, how was this, you know, you know, you know kind of process affecting maybe the different uh, bureaus? So, you know, it was one bureau kind of affect it more than others or you know, is it kind of all the same all the way around especially in today's yeah. time or well it started with manhattan right um yeah which used to have all these great neighborhoods you know like um and, and a lot of the neighborhoods have been kind of homogenized you know what i mean just because uh you know they used to be ethnic neighborhoods like um you know there was an italian neighborhood a black neighborhood an irish neighborhood um Chinese neighborhood, you know, like where immigrants or different social, you know, there's a gay neighborhood um, where different enclaves, you know, which is makes the city so rich. And those all sort of got, you know, kind of steamrolled by, uh, you know, it used to be the rich people lived on the Upper East Side, you know, like uh, like that show that Jefferson's moving on up to the, the East Side. It was like that's right. where the rich people wanted to live. And then through this process, it just became people wanted Soho lofts and then people started building, you know, Greenwich Village where all the artists were. They were priced out. So so it kind of got homogenized in that way. And then everybody started moving to like Brooklyn. Right. And now yeah. Brooklyn is so expensive, you know, that that uh, people are moving to Queens, you know. And I remember at a certain point in the 2000s, people wanted to, you know, the place for artists was like like Flushing, Queens, which used to be this Chinese American neighborhood, you know, this, like the largest Chinatown, suddenly there's yeah. all these artists living there, but now it's like the last remaining place is the Bronx, which was like, you know, burning in the, in the seventies, you know, it was the hardest hit. And now that's yeah. becoming gentrified a bit. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, public housing in New York, which is helpful, right? Like government, you know, like HUD, HUD housing and the housing authority. I think they have the largest housing authority. So you have these enclaves of that that remain. And then you also have like, um, there's some rent control departments. So you have like sort of these like crabby 70 year old New Yorkers, you know, who, who complain about the tall buildings. They're still there, you know, but, but one of the things that happened is, is people began to uh, like, during the, you know, real estate moves in cycles. So during these cycles, when uh, some people would like, there was this, the largest affordable housing complex in New York was called Stuyvesant Town, Peter Cooper Village. And this was in, yeah. in Manhattan itself, but there was also one that was even bigger, I think, maybe in the Bronx called Star at 
village or something. I think it's where yeah. um, Sonia Saltemeyer is from, I think. And that's in another borough. But both of these uh, projects, they weren't government subsidized, but they were rent controlled. And yeah. so they came up for sale be before the subprime crisis, I think. And the only and people were so desperate for housing that the bids were really high. So only the people who had the most optimistic bids won. And in Stuyvesant Peter Cooper Village, which was built after the war for like firemen and policemen and stuff and teachers, um, Tishman Spire, which owns Rock Rockefeller Center, they're the ones that won. And they bid based on their projections that they can make more money. The only way to make the money, to make, to make back the money that they uh, sunk into this, it was like $5 billion because it was, it was a huge air, uh, area. Um, and and the, a lot of it was California teachers, pension money, you know, CalPERS. That's what they relied on for this. The only way they can make back the money uh, for what they had paid was to get rid of rent controlled apartments. You know, so they have relied on these overly optimistic projections of how many people were living illegally in rent controlled apartments. And then suddenly they had this pressure to force people out of rent controlled apartments who were there illegally. So and that happened a, around the city. You know, people started hiring private investigators to find, you know, somebody was subletting um, and they, you know, tenants complained. And that also fed this huge backlash. But that happened in the in 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 some of these other project, uh, big house. I mean, I focus mainly on Manhattan just to keep it manageable, but that same thing happened in the boroughs itself. So um, now I don't even remember. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it spread throughout the city and it's a problem in cities around the country, around the country. You know, it's kind of yeah, indicative well, of that, especially the coastal cities. I don't know about Memphis. Like I know Memphis yeah. has good music, but I don't know if it's, if, if it's getting gentrified out and stuff yet. It probably yeah. is, right? I don't um, know what's, what's going on yeah, down there. Not, not, you know, you know, here it's is is not not as big. I mean, we're kind of that wedge between the Midwest and and the South. Um, you know, so we're you know we have some you know kind of pockets within neighborhoods that get gentrified, but for the most part, as a city, you know, um, we're starting to get some influx, and this kind of leads me to my next question, actually. Um, but we're getting some influx, Adam, of kind of folks coming in just because the inexpensive nature. Um, of living here, you know, rents here in Memphis, uh, you know, I know pre pandemic, we kind of toggled with Cleveland, Ohio as some of the lowest rent, um, you know, in the country, uh, in terms of some of the major, you know, cities, you know, you know, say top 75 cities or whatever. And so, you know, we, we've gotten some attraction of that, especially during the pandemic, which is something I wanted to ask you was, you know, what, what's been kind of the, the we've seen some of the impact of the pandemic on New York in terms of what we see as the outside world. You know how, you know, again, when you've got nine and a half million people within a small square footage radius, which, by the way, um, in terms of square mileage, Memphis is larger than New York City. Oh, wow. um, just in terms of square mileage. So, so that's always interesting. Some of the small. Uh, there's some, you know, southern cities that are much smaller in terms of population, but uh, are larger in terms of square mileage of, of uh, you know, kind of land mass. And so yeah. because New York, has, you have such a concentrated, um, you know, population there um, and very densely populated um, when something like the pandemic or, or the you know coronavirus hits, you know, I mean, I've, I've seen all kinds of movement to. You know, people coming back, the people leaving again, you know, and that sort of thing. Yeah. You know, what do you see as kind of the impact of the pandemic on New York? And do you expect that to be kind of, you know, uh, you know, maybe a, an impact in perpetuity uh, for the city? Well, surprisingly, like, um, I don't nobody really wanted to be in the city during the pandemic. That's that's not surprising. And and rents went down and they were, you know, desperate to, to you know, all sorts of deals and stuff. But surprisingly, since the pandemic, I mean, the, the housing market has just come back all guns blazing because, you know, um, well, I mean, when you're if you're young, you want to live in New York City, right? I mean, it's an exciting place to live. It's still got a reputation as, I mean, sort of kind of edgy and creative. And that's where the young people are. So young people with money have come back. And so the housing market is is actually on fire right now. It's like. It's, it's, it's ridiculous now, actually, the, the, the medium, I mean, one of the stories in New York is that in Manhattan, at least, I think it's Manhattan, maybe it's the whole city, I forget, but the, the medium rental price in the city now is so high 
that in order to to make the quali- to qualify for it and whatever you know 20 times whatever it is that real estate agents recommend you make in your salary to yeah. you need to make $150,000 a year or something you know just to live i think in Manhattan but maybe it's the whole city i'm not sure so that's that's pretty crazy and and it's just come back because you know people want to party they want to be around other single young people it's a great city to live if you're young and single i guess uh, so, and, and a lot of the jobs pay well, I guess. Um, so yeah, so the housing market has rebounded. What hasn't rebounded is the office market, you know, like, so for instance, right. like I said, I got priced out of the city a while ago and, um, I live in a city where 30% uh, in a town where 30% of the town commutes to New York city. I just, m- my wife teaches at this university here. So, um, but a lot of people who live here are finance professionals. It's 30% of the city commutes and you go to the commuter parking lot for the Metro North train, the uh, commuter train, and, and it's empty now, you know, nobody's going into the city. Everybody works from home. And so like Steve Ross, who's in the book, like I said, with Hudson Yards, they have, they built like high end, the top of the top office space to compete with other cities where, you know, they have, fiber optics and all this stuff. So they have pretty high um, rates, but a lot of offices are kind of empty. You know, people are trading up to better office space and, and, uh, and banks have been extending and pretending, you know, and, and a lot of loans are, are going to come due and it's going to be carnage, I think, for a lot of people who have the office space because they just don't have the occupancy and the, the, the cost for a square foot for office space has gone down. And and one of the things that, that I did in my book is, you know, real, like I said, real estate moves in cycles. So it was fun covering characters as they move through these cycles. And there's one guy that I covered named Ken Swig who bought billions of dollars worth of real estate and, and, and include, and, and, and then um, he kind of went belly up during subprime and, and it's an interesting drama because he was, he was willing to share the details. Actually, he was an heir to this real estate fortune, but he had given all these guarantees. So was, he was sued by all these creditors and his credit cards were frozen and he was sleeping on couches. And I don't know, it's a great story. But but anyways, we can expect that to happen now. Like we're on the cusp of that in New yeah. York now. Interest rates are really high. It's hard to refinance. Um, but, but uh, you know, what they did in the SNL crisis in the 90s, uh, People yeah. overbuilt downtown. And then the, the uh, I, I can't remember whether it's under Mayor Dinkins or Giuliani, but they passed zoning that allowed people to uh, convert these old office space into residential. So probably that'll be what happens. Like people will convert some of this office space if we actually don't go back to the office, if, if the stay at home trend, work from home trend continues, they'll convert some of this surplus space to residential which uh, there's always demand for, or, you know, um, people will default on their loans and other people will scoop up these offices for really cheap. And then they'll be able to, their cost basis will be lower. So they'll be able to rent it, but there's going to be some carnage probably before then. And we're already starting to see that. Um, And, you know, some people have gone under or are in trouble, um, you know, uh, for some of this ultra high end stuff, just because of the pandemic and, and retail also that even before the pandemic, there was what they call the retail apocalypse, right? Like, you know, everybody right. was buying online. So a lot of s- stuff was going out. I was just reading on, this isn't in New York City, but I was reading about the American Dream Mall, which is supposed to be the second largest mall and it uh, in the US with like a wave pool. And the, the big thing there, and they were doing this in Hudson Yards too, is you draw people in with these experiential things, right? But Nobody wanted to go ice skating and or surfing inside a mall during the pandemic, right? So right. that's been right. having problems too. And we'll see what yeah, happens no there. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, no, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt about it. So where can people get the book, man? Um, you know, when they want to learn uh, so, some more about this and where can we get yeah, it? Yeah, it's, it's on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles. Um, we're about to put out the ebook. Like they just put out the the cut the uh, hardcover at first without an ebook because they wanted people to buy the hardcover, but the ebook's coming soon. But if you just go to Amazon, you awesome. type in new kids in New York or my name. Yeah. It's, it's a good read. I think I, I've heard, I've heard good things about it from people, which surprised me because, you know, by the time you finish a book, you're bored of the topic, but um, 
But I tried to, you know, follow characters and have a plot while also yeah. explaining how cities transform and how the industry works. Yep. No, love it, man. So yeah, that link, uh, NYB community is in the show notes. So make sure to click there so that you can get a copy of Adam Peori's new book, uh, the new Kings of New York. Make sure that, uh, you get a copy of that. Uh, when you pick up your copy, um, send me a screenshot of it and uh, I may have something nice for you. Um, uh, if you send me a screenshot that you purchased the book and then I can also share that with Adam as well. Um, uh, so we want to definitely show our, our, our love and support. Uh, Adam, what's next for you, man? After this book, uh, do you have uh, other content that you're looking to kind of put out there? We should be on the lookout for. Uh, well, yeah, I don't, you know, I'm a freelancer, so I, well, I have a contract with Newsweek to do a cover story a month. So I just did one on, uh, on, on, you know, the, the impact of war on children and efforts to save Ukrainian children. I got a cover story coming out on, I think on abortion and the impact of that. And, um, so I write for Newsweek a lot and biz, sometimes business week and, um, and, uh, other places, Columbia journalism review, but I'm not sure what I'm going to do my next book on. I'm looking for a good story. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of still writing about real estate. Maybe I'll do another business book, another real estate book, but really I just like to write about people. So I haven't yeah. decided yet, but, um, yeah. but yeah, I'm a, you know, you Google my name, you can read all my, or follow me on Twitter. You can read all my stories, which are all, uh, you know, long magazine pieces. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Uh, we'll do that. So Adam, this has been great, man. Very informative. I, I appreciate your insight and kind of covering these stories. It, it gets information out to the rest of us so that we can become a little bit more knowledgeable and then thus be you know a little bit better in what we do. Um, and uh, or, or can support causes uh, maybe a little bit better uh, when that calls for. So uh, we appreciate your work, man. And I appreciate you taking time to, to join us here on the pod. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yep. Okay, excellent. Good. So listen, everybody, Adam Piori, make sure that you go to Amazon. Well, the link's in the show notes, but make sure you go there, get a copy of the book and uh, and follow Adam. Um, you, uh, there in the, in the show notes, you can follow him um, yeah, on Twitter. Make sure you do that. That's probably one of the great ways to keep track of what he's got going and in kind of more real time. And again, pick up a copy of the book. You know, and again, when, when you uh, do your screenshot, if you want to put it on Twitter, tag him. Right. And then that way, uh, that's just additional way to get some visibility and, and let Adam know that uh, you're in support. So, yeah, take a pic quick picture of it and and uh, and tag him on Twitter. Um, that, that'd be very awesome. So definitely do that. And we appreciate Adam again taking time uh, to join us here on episode 296 of the Minding Your Business podcast. So thanks for everybody. Thanks for everybody that's been uh, tuning in here. We've gotten some great comments uh, from some folks. Um, that have been joining in and uh, yeah, good convo as a realtor instructor in Memphis will like a book and share with real estate students. Thanks, Adam and, and Ron. So now yeah, we appreciate that. And uh, yeah, we'd love for you to pick up uh, your book and encourage it for your students. It's, it's a, a good way and you're getting it from someone that's a journalist, right? You're not getting it from a, you know, kind of a real estate yuppie. You're getting it from a totally different perspective, um, a more journalistic perspective. And so, Definitely want to encourage you all you know, to do that. And if you have it in your class, take a picture of the whole class and then tag Adam. That'd be awesome, too. Um, I'm sure he'd love to be able to, to, to see that. Um, so anyway, we're going to get out of here. Uh, thank you all so, so much. Uh, you've been great in all your support. Share this podcast uh, with friends, family, maybe even a few enemies. Um, yeah, definitely do that. And uh, again, connect with Adam and get a copy of the book. Uh, ASAP. And I will be doing that here as well. Three things that unite us all, no matter where you're from, no matter what side of the tracks that you're from, even if you're from New York, <laughs> three things that unite us all. Um, we all want to be a little bit better for ourselves, a little bit better for our families and a little bit better for our communities. Right. And so if we can keep all those three things in mind, we all want to be a little bit better for ourselves, our families and our communities. If we keep those things in mind with everybody that we meet, man, when we make this place a whole lot better, you know, there's we'll always find things that divide us. Right. And things we can disagree and bitch about all day. Um, speaking of Twitter, you can go find there. You can go on Clubhouse. You can find people bitching about something all the time. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, those three things we're all trying to get to. Right. So keep those things in mind. And 
if you do that, again, you, you'll enrich your life and we all collectively will make this place a little bit better. I'll see you on the next episode. Until then, peace to you.